Before we get started, I would like to introduce our Dean, um, Dale Smith, who will talk a little bit about our webinar series and what's coming up. Um, Dean Smith. Thank you, Nola. I'd like to uh, join Nola in welcoming everyone to our webinar series, LMU Business Insights. It's our 2.0. Our webinar series provides our community with valuable knowledge, experience, and insights to navigate what I'm now calling a very fluid situation due to the COVID pandemic. LMU Business Insights is aligned with our mission of the business school to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global community. We are proud to bring you our very first six part series hosted by the M School in CBA. The M School is a unique marketing pathway among our marketing majors that develops our next generation of storytellers, innovators and strategists. In this cutting edge six part series, a top business expert on innovation, a true thought leader speaking to disruptions, trends and technologies of the future will engage you with topics that we all need to be thinking about as we move into the future post corona landscape. So now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Andy Grom, our marketing professor and one of the co-directors of the M School to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Nola. Thank you, Dale. My colleagues and I are really super excited to introduce our special guest today. He's a brilliant creator and strategist who has led the creative efforts at some of the world's leading agencies, including BBDNO and Ogilvy. And now he spreads, spends, he spreads his awesomeness as a professional speaker, executive trainer, coach, and consultant for transformation, adaptation, innovation, and disruptive market strategies. Today, is the first of our six part series. Dimar is gonna talk about chaos. And I have to warn you, if you don't like energy or ideas or props, you're gonna hate this talk. But if you like those things, you're gonna love this talk. Broadcasting live from Vienna, Austria, one of our favorite people of all time, Dietmar Dahmen. Hello, everybody. I'm super excited to be with you. I'm very, very happy. It is nighttime here in Austria. I know that you got up for students relatively early to join here. So I'm really excited to share my screen very soon and share my insights. Uh, this is, as we were saying, this is a six part series uh, about COVID times and Corona. I call it What's Next with six X's. And as you can see, the first X is the C. And in, today we're gonna talk about the topic from chaos to creativity. Chaos is actually a very good platform to start the creative process and to do awesome creative and to come up with awesome creative solutions. That this chaos and the creativity it comes with is not new, we all know. It actually started way before Corona. It started BC hundreds of thousands of years ago before Corona, actually 70,000 years ago to be precise. 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens lived in Africa. And then they said, living in Africa, the most amazing thing that is still with us today, the sentence that drives innovation till the day to day. And this sentence is, I am bored. Let's go somewhere new. I've seen this place. I love the paradise. It's great, but I want to go somewhere else. And then they left Africa. And first they reached Asia, and then later they reached Europe, and they actually came to new horizons, saw new things, and they really loved the new environment. But there was one problem. When they went to Europe, there were already people there. And those people, as we all know, were the Neanderthals. And how come that if you look at Europeans today and the global populations, there's like maybe 2% Neanderthalian genes in us, but 98% Homo sapiens. Why is it that Homo sapiens outperformed the existing Neanderthals so drastically? And if you know a little bit about biology and maybe even read the book, Sapiens, which is a very, very good book, by the way, uh, you might know that the name sapiens means the wise ones. So you say, yeah, we are the wise ones. They were the idiotic Neanderthals. Look at our brains. And actually, this is a skull of a sapiens. And if you measure the skull of a sapiens inside, you will see that the brain of a in this skull is 1,450 cubic centimeters big. So you say, we must be unbelievably smart. 
But then you find the skull of a Neanderthal. And the skull of the Neanderthal is actually 1,600 cubic centimeter. So the Neanderthals had more brains than us. And that might mean that they were smarter than us, that they had more cognitive power than us. So it wasn't the brains. And then I know you live in Los Angeles, there's Muscle Beach, so obviously you say, hey, I know what it is, we were stronger than them, we had more muscle. And then you look at the individual Homo sapiens and compare them to Neanderthal, and there you already see the Neanderthals were shorter, but much more heavily built and much stronger. So it wasn't muscle, every single Homo sapiens was more stupid and weaker than a Neanderthal. It wasn't that, what was our secret? Why did we win? And the secret as described in Sapiens is very, very simple. The secret is that we had bigger teams. The Neanderthals and the other, organis and the other humanoids, they formed teams that were approximately 45 people or 45 individuals strong. We could form groups up to 150 people. And if you have 45 strong, smart people, but 150 slightly less smart, slightly less strong people, the group will win. Because in the group, together, we have three times more power, and we have three times more knowledge, and we have three times more BAM. Our success was the collaboration, and that is what we still do. Our strength is to come together to collaborate, and that's what we do. We work together. You come to corporate and you work together, you study together, you go to LMU to see other colleagues and other students and get inspirations from other people. You play together when you go to the beach. I don't know if they are open in Los Angeles right now, but that's what you do. And we are even here at this webinar together, although it spans the world, we are all here at next what's next together and this is our strength and that strength of cooperation and being together and having big groups was heavily disrupted by the coronavirus. It broke everything apart. We could not be together anymore and that jumped us and jolted us into absolute chaos. So let's look at what chaos actually is. And the secret, the secret ingredients, again, is the power. The secret ingredients is the word together. And together is what we do. When we form a group, we group stuff together. We say all the skeletons go in this side. And if they were to have shoes and your mom tells you clean up the room, you put the shoes where the skeletons are not. If you go, I'm looking at my kitchen right now, in the cupboard are the cups. We put all the cups together that's a clean room. So placing stuff together means we like to centralize stuff. And if you look at groups, groups need to come together. Groups need to be centralized. And that's why we centralize everything. Our work is centralized. We all come together normally to an office, right? Our politician, uh, political decisions are centralized. Here, picture of the United Nations. They all come together. Your education is centralized. There's a campus, LMU, where everybody can come together. And we even like to play centralized. And business, very, very often, is centralized. And in the business mind, we think centralized. And we see business as if it were bowling. We see that there is a clear goal. We need to kill those. We need to uh, get rid of all those bowling pins. And we have a certain tool, which is the ball, which is our budget. And then we throw the budget at the goal. And then it's really, really great. And a manager can say, yeah, I achieved the goal. It's fantastic. And we all love goals. And we all love easy targets that are grouped together. And the problem of that is, that we are not the only ones who love group groups and easy target. So does the virus. That's why the ball changed to the virus below. And the virus, boom, hit everything together. And all of a sudden, the centralized pins become decentralized pins. And everything is not grouped together anymore. Everything just flies around and is decentralized. And when the COVID crisis hit, we said, oh no, decentralization is chaos. I don't know where anything is anymore. All of a sudden, some cups are here and some glasses are there and the skeletons are on the roof and then there's a, a, a fork on the floor. Everything is decentralized. I cannot find anything. I don't know how to work in a decentralized situation. But then we were forced, at least in Europe, with total lockdown to chill. 
and we chilled and we got used to it. And at one point we said, oh, you know what? Actually, now that I'm getting used to it, I think decentralization works. And we just adapted to the new situation. And today we have decentralized meeting rooms. We don't come necessarily to one actual physical office building together. We just go to a digital office building, which is a, a Zoom building in this particular case. And we have decentralized meeting room. My room is Vienna. Your room is in Vienna. Your room is in Los Angeles. How decentralized can you be? And then we have decentralized restaurants. All the restaurants in Vienna are closed currently because we're under total lockdown, but I can still order food. So the kitchen where the food is prepared in the restaurant might be miles away from the table where I eat it. That is totally decentralized. We have decentralized movie theaters and obviously we have decentralized classrooms. All of you attending are in other places. We are not together. So the old chaos became the new normal. And the interesting thing about that is that the actual period of chaos was relatively short. There was a short period of destruction, which defines the new and the new normal. And then comes a new, a very long period of a new structure that we now call normal. In the business world and in the handout you will receive, you might see that the new structure is actually less than less like a bowling alley and more like playing pinball. It's much more chaotic, but it's anyway, it's a new structure. And this happens to you all the time. Just remember when you graduated from school, there was a short period of chaos. You were wondering after graduation, where, sh what shall I study? Where shall I study? Shall I become a DJ? Shall I become a, uh, uh, take a year off? It was a completely new situation and a new freedom. But after this freedom where everything was possible for a short period a time came a very long period of structure because you decided to study business or marketing, you decided to do this every day, you decided to go to LMU, and this is now the new normal, the normal of the new normal thing. And this is not only with biological beings like us, this is the same case for everything, even the universe. The Big Bang was a very short moment of absolute chaos, ultra new, where everything was possible, all the chemical uh, substances were formed, the laws of physics were made, all those things were possible and they could have gone either way, this way or that way, but they all went in a certain way because if they didn't, we, our universe might have co would collapse and we would not have one. But our universe exists and it's been existing for a long time and that is a very long structure, very rigid and that is normal to us with very set physical uh, formulas, very set chemical products and stuff like that. And in this new universe that is now normal and that developed after the, the uh, chaos, the universe that is structured and rigid, fewer things are possible. So in the moment of chaos, Everything is possible. If you take Legos apart and you didn't build anything yet and you just have the blocks spread around chaotically, every future shape of those little blocks has the same likelihood. I could build from those open blocks either a house or a rocket, or a ship, or a whatever, a, an animal. Everything has the same likelihood. It's an open form. There's nothing that drives this shape to a specific thing. But the minute I start building something, and I give the chaos structure, the possibilities limit themselves. And I don't have an open a likelihood where everything has the same likelihood of appearing. It's a one shape likelihood. This is a spaceship and that's it. It is not a house. It is not a dog. It is not a car. It's the Millennium Falcon. So it's a closed form. And if I want to do something new out of this closed form, I have to take it apart again. I have to take the structure and create chaos. I have to create another open form. And then I can use the open form to build another new, new form. So the thing is that the moment of creativity needs chaos and creativity actually benefits from chaos. You as students might know 
that you like to work in slightly more chaotic environments to come up with creative ideas. It is very tough to come up with creative ideas if you're sitting at a desk on a rigid chair and you just have a white piece of paper in front of you and they say, create the new painting now. It is much easier to go somewhere fun. And where students like to go, obviously, is a coffee shop. And there's actually an effect called the coffee shop effect. There's actually research that says in a slightly noisy environment where there's movement, unexpected movement, where there's a little bit of chaos in the air and where other people are working as well, we are stimulated. So chaos stimulates us because take chaos takes us away from the comfort of repeating the same rigid structure over and over again. This ultra open moment of creativity is what I call quantum creativity. Because in the quantum creativity, there's no fixed status. Every shape is possible. The opportunities and the likelihood of being things, what you can do is limitless. Nothing is decided. And if you want to work with quantum creativity, you have to do things like brainstorming. You have to be positive where everything is possible. Nothing is judged on. You just go and do crazy stuff. And in order to keep the quantum creativity going and never stopping, I would suggest that you use a technique from stand-up comedy and improv theater, and that is to say to everything, yes, and. Yeah, let's build a spaceship. Yes, and let's do it with a laser. Yes, and it should fly and have wings. Yes, but it should also have a green uh, escape door. If you keep doing things like that and adding yes, and you keep the quantum creativity going. That is very, very good. So for now, we do a workshop. And since you are decentralized, I do the workshop for you. It's very easy. I have here a deck of cards. And the question is, what can you do with this deck of cards? And I bet there's millions of things that you come up with what one can do with a deck of cards. Obviously, what I just did is you can make a fan if you're hot. Uh, you can potentially build a house of it. Uh, you can read the future. You can play a guard card game. You can throw them around. And you can do all kinds of amazing things. And all those ideas that you just came up with in the quantum creativity realm are great. But if I have a specific problem, all those ideas are wrong. They are not good. Because if my problem is that my chair is wobbly, the only thing that I want you to come up with is that you can use this deck of card and put it under the chair. And this is not open creativity. This is not quantum creativity. This is highly targeted creativity, reduced creativity. And this is what I call binary creativity. Because you have a certain problem and then you judge this problem. Is the problem, does the creativity creative solution that was just introduced to me solve the problem, yes or no. And if it does, it's good. And if it doesn't, it's bad. And if you work in marketing, very often you will be dealing with binary creativity where you have a specific target and the success and the quality of your cre creativity is actually measured against the specific target. So binary creativity is very much structured. It is less fun. And it, stunts with, and it start, always starts with a sentence that you should never use in brainstorming. And that sentence is no because. You can't do this. No, because it's too expensive. And then you come up with, oh my God, it has to be cheaper. But we cannot do this because blah, 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 blah. There's always a no because. And we hate problems because we say, oh my God, a problem is uh, is adding problems. A problem is an annoying thing. It's what I'm, my creative solution is tested and evaluated against, and I hate it. But in reality, problems actually can be fun. Problems can be fun. If you look at this golf ball, and the game of golf were to be played that you put a ball into a hole, it would be totally boring. Only if you add the problem that you can do that, but only by using this particular golf stick, a golf club, then it's fun. It is really boring to put a ball, a ball into a net. It's only interesting if the net is really high, and then there's another team that wants to, to stop you doing that, right? So problems are fun. It's actually creative inspiration that drives us. We see the problem as a challenge, and it's great. The second thing is that problem can ignite creativity. If I give you a very open creative task, like create a shoe, 
you can come up with all kinds of solutions. But if I now add problems and I say this should not be any shoe, it should be a shoe for jogging. And it should, it should be actually a shoe for jogging at night. The more problems I add, the funner it gets. Because then your creative creativity is much more focused, much more dense, much more laser-like and sharp and comes up with solutions for that particular problem. A shoe is whatever, a shoe for jogging at night. Oh yeah, I see lights, I see electricity, I see navigation system. It's much more daring, much more uh, broadening and much more inspiring than without the problem. And thirdly, the problems which, uh, the the pain that I talked about before exists, but the problems increase the pain and the pain is actually a great reason to be creative. If you look at the level of pain and the level of innovation, and if you look at regular companies and the level of pain is really low, then it's very likely that the level of information is as low and that you come up with really small ideas, that you have safe progress. Why dare something if everything is safe anywhere? That you have incremental innovation, that you're doing continuous improvement and upgrades, but nothing radical. In Europe, we have a chocolate called Kinder Schokolade. This is the old packaging that they had for 30 years, and now this is the new one. <laughs> Not much of a difference because they say, yeah, we don't have a problem. Everybody loves us. Let's keep it safe. But if you have a very big problem and the level of pain is really high, then probably the, rev the level of innovation is high and you don't come up with a small idea, you come up with a big idea. You come up with things that are radical progress, disruptive innovation, unknown territory outside of your expertise. Look at the problems we are facing now with COVID. The solution to this is a vaccine based on mRNA that was never been done before. In regular times, this would have never been okayed so quickly, but it's a big level of pain, it's a big idea, and it's a big execution. And then you might say, yeah, but there's a lot of people that are very creative. Look at Elon Musk, and he comes up with spaceships and stuff like that. He's a creative genius, and there is no pain. Well, there's a lot of pain with Elon Musk. Elon Musk, if you read the last sentence in, in the white box, said that the planet Earth might be left in, in uninhabitable by, as, by nuclear war or something like that. He is afraid of, of Earth being uninhabitable. That's a major pain. But if nobody feels any pain, the level of innovation is low. And we decide much more radical when we're aggravated. If we hate things, if the Hulk is the Hulk because he hates things, his decisions are strong, courageous, and amazingly immediate. If he's the other guy, he just waits and drinks tea. So the less pain, the less innovation. Corona obviously increased the level of pain drastically. And not just that. It also increased the level of innovation drastically and the, rev the level of implementation of this innovation. This is a chart for about the digitization of customer interaction and they say that we jumped from 2020 to 2023. In North America, we have an adaptation acceleration of three years. The number of days big corporations need to introduce things like even as easy as home office is estimated to be 454. And in Corona times, they needed 10.5 days. I bet that you as a university changed everything, I don't know, within a week and moved to Zoom and stuff like that. So the number of days needed to actually act on those things is now 40 times faster than before. Why? Because the pain level is higher and we act, there's no time to think. A lot of people love thinking. And if you think, you don't act. And I call this the analysis paralysis. If you have the Lego blocks, instead of working with them, you say, well, let's first look at the blocks and let's look at the material. And then we separate and put them in order by color. And then we find out how they work. No kid would ever do that. A kid just takes the blocks, put it together and sees if it's fun or not. A kid doesn't analyze, a kid acts. And change comes by doing, not by thinking. That is very important. Do not 
fall into the trap of analysis paralysis. Don't overthink, just act boldly. Find a problem and act on this. But this is easier said than done. This is Austria a couple of years ago, and you can see people are traveling, and everybody in Austria is traveling with what? With a suitcase. And we had suitcases for hundreds of thousands of years, and everybody had to carry the suitcase, and I can tell you nobody liked it. But the reaction to the problem of having to carry a suitcase was always the same. Well, there's nothing you can do. What can you do about it? Until one point, at one point in time, one person did not say there's nothing you can do about it. One person saw the problem, hated it so much, became the Hulk, and out of aggravation invented wheeled suitcases. The first wheeled suitcase was sold in 1972. We've been to the moon at that point in time and the astronauts had to carry their luggage and couldn't wheel it. And the astronauts said, well, there's nothing you can do until somebody said, fuck, yeah, there's something I can do and I'm just going to change it. So your job is to be a contrarian. Your job is to look at the problem and change this. And again, this is easier said than done because we have two major fears. In the handout you will receive, I will talk about three fears, but in this talk, because I have only a couple of minutes left, it's only two. The first one is the fear of failure. If you have the quantum creativity of being able to build anything, to come up with anything, to do anything in your corporation, build any business you want, some people might say, well, what if they don't like this innovation? And this fear of failure is very ancient. And you go, what if they don't like what I built? What if nobody does it? It's a very deep-rooted fear. It's ancient. And it, since it is an ancient, deep-rooted fear, there's no easy way to fight that. It needs training to get rid of. You have to really concentrate and get help and try to avoid being afraid of failure. Work on this. And the easiest tip is this. If you are inhibited to run outside because you're afraid that you might step in dog poo, if you're afraid that you might start a startup that might fail, be aware you will step in dog poo. You will fail. This is normal. You can all walk and you fell down many times before you could walk. You can all write and you misspelled many times and before you could actually could write. Learning is ex or, uh, excellence is the path. The failure is the path of excellence. Failure will lead you to become better. So if you step in dog poo, don't rub it in. Brush it off, avoid the shit, but keep running and keep doing it. And the final fear is the fear of risk. And you might say, if you have this, again, the quantum creativity state where you can do anything, what if I break my fingernails opening up those Lego things? I better leave them where they are. What if the boss says, that idea is way too dangerous. Uh, that's a much too radical idea. What if I'm not appreciated? And again, the fear of risk is very deeply rooted in us because we are taught to be risk aversive. If you look at fairy tales, especially European and German fairy tales, which are really evil, uh, you, there's a fairy tale called The Little Red Riding Hood. And in Little Red Riding Hood, they tell you to stay on the path. Stay on this path because the path is safe. But that is not true. The path is not necessarily safe because the wolf knows that you will be on the path. So the wolf just waits there. And there's actually nothing more dangerous than assumed safety. If you assume that you are safe and you don't take care of things because you hope that the stuff will go away, that's the most dangerous situation. So whenever you just follow the rules, don't do this. Ask yourself, really, is it really good to stay on the path? And if not, then you just say, fuck yeah, and kill the wolf, right? Deviate from the path. Break the rules. Rules are what we break. The memorable never emerge from a formula is what Bill Birnbach said in the, in the 50s. And that is true today. Break the rules. Your job is to be a rule breaker. So to wrap it up in two minutes or even less than that, we think that chaos is this evil, dangerous thing that we cannot control and that is full of fear. But in reality, 
Chaos is the stepping stone and the engine and the power for creativity to blossom and do amazing things. And we separate creativity, or I do, in quantum creativity. And that state of creativity is created by saying yes and over and over and over again. And the other thing is not the quantum creativity, but the binary creativity, very targeted. Do I solve the problem? Yes, no. And to get even more precise, you add problems. And whenever there's a solution, add another no because. Because the more no becauses you add, the more precise your solution will be. You have to embrace problems. They are friends. They ignite your creativity. They, come, they help you come up with crazy solutions and they sharpen your vision. But you should always say, fuck yeah, and don't be afraid of the problem. Think big. When you meet big problems, you have to think big. You have to act courageously. You have to break the rules. And one thing is that this crisis offers all the chaos you need. So please do not waste this powerful crisis. Embrace the crisis, embrace the power that you get, and embrace the chaos that comes with this to, in order to create creativity. This was my first keynote on creativity. There will be a handout for it. And the next one, when we meet again, is going to be on online. Because most creativity we see today happens online. Online is a humongous power driver, and we will discuss this next week. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Dietmar. That was amazing. And coming from a comic book fan, that was just way <laughs> too cool. And yes, you brought up Star Wars and I was even more excited. So thank you to everyone who um, submitted questions. Um, there is a there are a number of questions. So I'm just gonna roll right in and get started. And please do feel free to um, keep the questions flowing and upvote questions that you like. So I will start with um, from Professor Matt Steffel. We'll start with that one. With the increasing rate of innovation and pain, is this new post-COVID world sustainable or do we run the risk of burnout? Uh, there's, if you look, it depends on how you define sustainability. There will actually be a, uh, the, the, the fifth, uh, installment is going to be on nature and sustainability. And if you look at uh, what is happening right now is that there's a lot of uh, um, the, the people are really conscious about the nature and they are conscious about the environment and stuff like that. And there's all this government funding, at least in Europe and probably in the US, going into business and to help business survive. And those things are a little bit targeted creativity as well. If you look at the airline industry, they need money right now, but they need to develop electric engines. They have to be CO2 neutral in 10 years. So what happens is that in the amazing moment of absolute chaos, where everything is spread out, you can define the rules of what you might build. You can say, yes, we help you put those pieces together again, but beware. They need to be uh, good for the environment, good for the people. We should, they should not alienate us. They should not distance each other, uh, us from each other. Uh, other and stuff like that. And I think that um, there's a, a big, big trend to make sure that the companies that survive and the companies that get help actually act sustainable and, and good for the planet. So I think that the innovation has to be targeted. And the question is always who targets it? And in Europe, the answer is very easy, the government, because we have a very strong European Union, there's very strong rules. In the US, it's probably actually the business leaders. The business leaders that decide, oh, I want that my customer is not uh, just a, a, a money machine that I can, you know, that, that I can take money out of. I actually want to do good. So if you're a business leader of the future and if you innovate your things, it is your responsibility to do stuff. I often say, we say, we should be conscious. We should be good. Who is we? You is we. You. You. Every single one of you. If you act Nicely, the world will be better. If you act evil, the world will be not so nice. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a question from Plamena. Thank you for your question. How do we get people on board with chaotic ideas? Uh, by doing it. Uh, the most important thing is that if you overthink anything, if you say, oh my God, shall I invite a priest and a guitarist and a dentist? Uh, 
uh, and you overthink it, you might actually fall into the trap of analysis paralysis. Don't overthink it, just do it. If you look at kids playing, they just look at who's in the room, who's fun, bring them together and start a game. So I think what I would do is I would really, really encourage everybody to walk the path that nobody walked before, deviate from the path, get a crazy group of people and just try it out. The, idea, the amazing thing about open creativity, quantum state, is nothing is really done yet. It's all ideas. The uh, evaluation of the idea is a totally different mindset. The evaluation of the idea is much more targeted creativity. But coming up with ideas should just be crazy. So just get a bunch of people together, uh, and surprise them and say, hey, I have a totally surprise problem. And then you can even add more problems. You can even say, yeah, let's do it. And then we should also do it that, for instance, I want to do a business. It should be a haircutting business, but I don't want to have any humans involved. What do I do now? And there will be, the, the more problems you have, the crazier the ideas and the bigger the ideas and the more open your mind gets. So that's my advice to you. Do it. Don't overthink it. I hope this helps a little bit. Absolutely. Um, we do have a question from Kristen, and thank you for asking this because I'm, I'm on the same boat. We, we are taught to imagine every outcome, every possible response, every need, and every solution. The analysis has become a habit, especially for us strategists. How do you recommend we still strategize without holding back creativity? Both are necessary for success, and I completely agree. Yeah, I think there's uh, what I did with the idea of uh, quantum creativity and uh, binary creativity is that I split it in two. So I said there's two separate jobs. They are not one job. And if you look at innovation, there are various people involved in innovation. There's the person who hates something. I hate carrying suitcases. There's the person who comes up with the idea, the creative mind. Why don't we put a wheel on it? There's a person who implements it. I can actually put a wheel on a thing. And then there's a person who sells it. And then there's people who buy it. So you need every single one. And those individuals are not the same. So you have to ask yourself, what is my job as a strategist uh, in the team so that the team can benefit, the team as a whole can benefit from my input? And maybe it is to be the creative killer, the asshole who thinks too much, but do it at the right point in time. If you do that during brainstorming, you kill everything. Nothing is more the creative quantum a, 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 a quantum creativity killer than no because. Always in, in that phase say yes and. But once you're thinking about is it right for me at no because all the time. So separate the creative moment into different uh, zones and separate the jobs into different jobs. I hope this helps also. <laughs> yes and. <laughs> Yes, um, and, yes. So, so we have um, a question here. What do you think the cultural barriers are to helping us move organizations to be more creative? How do we overcome the naysayers, like you said, like you were just talking about? Uh, the only thing is that, again, we, who is we? We is you. You cannot overcome the naysayers because the naysayers as an entity don't exist. It's an individual. And you have to fight an individual or your group has to fight an individual group. But it's, it's always very specific. So you have to say, why do those people not want to be creative? What blocks them? And then there's various ways to do it. One is to simply do it anyway. There's a famous saying that says, it's very hard to allow, but it's easy to forgive. So if, you're, if your boss doesn't want you to be creative and you're creative anyway and it proves to be a success, it's good. Of course, it's a high risk. Every startup is a high risk. You might step in shit. You probably will. You have to be able to deal with that. But if you don't walk that walk, you will never achieve anything. And we is always you. So you have to be the first one to say, I don't accept naysaying. I actually fight this. And be aggravated. Hate it. Because then if you are... If you don't really care, you never get the energy to change things. But if you really care, if you are absolutely upset, if you are mad because somebody again left a plastic bag on, uh, on the beach, then you say no more plastic bags, it's enough. We were just talking about when I wrote this, we were talking that when we moved to Vienna, which was 20 years ago, there was actually dog poo on the streets. 
you could actually step into dog poo. Now you have to pay 5,000 euros, $6,000, and there's no more dog poo. So of course, it's a very drastic measure, and you have to think about, do I want that? But you can solve problems by being really dramatic and coming up with big solutions. Big problems need big solutions. Be courageous and do it. Awesome. And actually, what you just said first coincides with this next question. What was the most creative or proudest solutions you came up with because of chaos? Oh, that is a relatively long story, which I try to sell short, tell short. I used to work in advertising and I was a creative director and executive creative director. And what you, do, what you did back then is that you had actual uh, boards on one side of the board was the image and you presented it to the client and the other side of the board is blank. So you had, it was uh, the, the advertising, the print advertising was actually glued onto a board and you presented that to the customer. And we actually flew someplace and then we noticed that we have the wrong boards. So we had the wrong pictures. It, we had the boards for BMW and we were presenting Ritter Sport chocolate. So that was a very, very chaotic moment. So I did two things. One, of course, was first warn the team that was presenting for BMW, you have our boards, you have the wrong material, you have to act. And then I actually presented the back sides of the pages only. And I used the imagination of the audience because I knew what was supposed to be there. And I said, imagine a landscape built out of sugar and, uh, and then I described it and they said it was so lovely and wonderful. They all saw the thing which didn't exist. So that was a creative way to sell something out of chaos. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, Vimar, we do have a couple more questions, but I do want to put up a QR code for our students. For those of you who um, are doing CBA Advantage, it's time to get your points, so please do scan. Uh, but for Dietmar, we have another few more questions um, with time. How do you keep motivation up when things don't change and are stagnant? There's actually in the handout yet that you will receive, there's a trick, and that trick is called the Batman effect. And the thing is that if you are weak and you don't have any ideas, the easiest thing is to be be somebody else, put on the mask and pretend to be a superhero. It works for Bruce Wayne, right? He pretends to be Batman. He puts on a mask. Beyonce, you might know, has an alter ego called, I think, Sasha Fierce. She is not Beyonce on stage. Beyonce would never move so sexy and be so crazy in public, but Sasha Fierce does. So you might not be so creative, but maybe your creative alter ego, your creative superhero is. So use the Batman effect and that helps me motivate because the thing is that it's much harder for me personally to motivate myself than to pretend to be somebody else who is motivated, who is full of energy and who, that person is not me. So the trick is to Get If you don't have the energy, pretend to be somebody else and get the energy from somebody else and that somebody else can be your alter ego. The other thing, of course, is to drink coffee. <laughs> I do love that. Uh, let's see. We've got about a minute. I'm going to do this really quick. Rule breaking does seem like it will get us to creative approaches, but what do you recommend if rule breaking gets you into trouble, kicked out of an organization and so forth? How do you figure out when to break the rules? Does it okay, seem like it should is, be always? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the consequences of rule breaking, if you look at more or less any, a, a lot of really big innovative superheroes that we see, a lot of them were kicked out of corporations. A lot of them were not liked by the people. A lot of people said that rap music is no music, that comic books make you stupid, that beat music even back then, the Beatles, oh my God, what a rebel. They all wore ties, right? So if you deviate from the path, there will be millions of people who will tell you why it is not good what you're doing. And the only person who can still believe in you is you and your close circle in the group. And if you can achieve to have 150 people like Homo sapiens back then, and those people believe in you, you can go anywhere. Don't just
follow the masses. Come up with something, and if the people say you break the rules, you say no, I redefine new rules. This is now the new kind of music. This is the new way to tell stories. That's how you make progress. Progress is always the negation of the existing, and people hate it when you take the old away. Because the old then dies, it's sad. But then the new comes, and the new might be better, hopefully. So you have to motivate yourself and get another team, other team members that help you, that believe in the idea and motivate you. And one little last thing, especially if you have smaller groups, if there's one person who is poisoning the atmosphere in the group, get rid of that person. If there's one person who doesn't believe in the project, who's afraid of the project, those things are infectious and you can actually get weaker and weaker and weaker. So choose your, your team wisely. Select really people that believe in the thing. If you are the Avengers, to come back to superheroes and Marvel comics, everybody knows that Ultron is a bad person. There's nobody who says, well, you know, there's actually, you know, you, they all share the same goal. And with the same goal, they can move everything and save the planet. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Dimar, this was such an engaging and inspiring presentation. Thank you so much. We Thank look you. forward to seeing you and everyone that has joined us today in our next session, next Thursday, February 11th, I believe. So looking forward to it. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Bye from Vienna. Bye bye. Take Thank care. You, Thanks, bye. Dimar. Thanks, everyone bye -bye. who came. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Dimar.